afternoon and welcome to Vote Chat. My name's Nicole Tabor and I'll be your host and interviewer for today's show. As always with the 2014 Vote Chat series, we are live streaming from the University of Otago's media production studio. Now hopefully you have joined us on the live stream, because if so, there's the opportunity for you to get involved through Twitter. Politics student Sam Hughes is covering the Twitter desk today, and here he is to tell you how you can get involved. Thanks, Nicole. Today, as usual, we will be accepting questions for our guests via social media. Today, we are joined by Matidia Tude, who is the co-leader of the Greens. If you have any questions for Matidia or the Greens, you can tweet them to us via our Twitter handle, at OUVoteChat. Alternatively, you can use the hashtag VoteChat14. But for now, back to Nicole. Thanks, Sam. So as Sam advised, we are indeed joined today by Materia Toure, who is the co-leader of the Green Party. Now, she's also championing child poverty, the selection, and she spent half her life in politics, being a spokesperson for a number of issues. She's also a candidate for Dunedin North. I'd like to welcome you now, Materia Toure. Kill them, kill them. So I'd like to start with something that I saw on the news last night, TV1. Yep. Mm -hmm. So there's the suggestion... Great poll, great poll was, 40%. Yes, 14%. Highest, yep, highest ever in, for the Greens in that poll. Yet Labour were down. Mm, and so is. therefore the suggestion has come that you may be looking for a radical change of strategy and maybe looking to go into government with the National Party. Mm -hmm. Now you've disputed this on your Twitter, yes. saying you're looking for a change of government. So you're absolutely ruling out being in government with National. Yes, we have said it is highly unlikely that we would have any governing arrangement with National. That's been our position now for over two elections. We've said our clear preference is to be in a coalition arrangement with Labour. And that is what we're focused on, 100% focused on changing the government so that we can deliver the cleaner, fairer and smarter Aotearoa that New Zealanders deserve. So where do you think this rumours come from? Well, you can read the polls as you like, and that is one way to... The, Corrin's story was one way to cut that, um, the analysis of the poll. Uh, it's certainly true that we need to keep on promoting and advocating for a change of government and encouraging people to vote for it. Uh, we know from the Duty Politics book that actually the right really likes it when people don't vote. But in fact, people need to take back our country. Uh, we need to take back our country, move it forward. We need to keep on reminding people that they have the power to change the government at this election. And so it really was a reading of the polls. There was a yeah. suggestion of a meeting. Did the meeting go ahead? We, we meet all the time to talk strategy. Honestly, it drives you, drives you mad. But it is one of the things that we do. Um, we're always talking about strategy. Last night we were talking about this weekend's media strategy, Russell's on the Nation. Tomorrow, uh, he and I are both on Q&A. We need to start making sure that we're you know, working together around what those messages are. That's part of the job. It's what we do every day. Also topical, uh, Wednesday we had a leaders debate on TV3 hosted yes. by John Campbell. Yeah. Now, are you guys pushing to be included in these? Yes, we did, and we talked with the networks about that, um, but they decided not to have... Uh, the Greens there. Uh, we are not. We are a. We are not a small party. I mean, that's very clear. We are well beyond the five percent threshold, uh, and we think that uh, these leaders' debates need to have a focus on who will form the government, not just on who will be prime minister. Elections are not a, a Mr New Zealand competition. They are about who will be part of the government, who will be leading the direction of the government, uh, and the Greens should have been part of those debates. And for the first leaders' debate that was on TV1, you ran the green room, yes. um, where in the ad breaks you effectively discussed what you'd seen, yep. given a bit of commentary and gave your policies. Why didn't you run one this time? Oh, we are intending to run one next week. Okay. Um, so you know, it's all a question of resources. We don't have anything like the money for broadcasting that uh, National and Labour have, so we do what we can. But the green room, we did it this, we've done it this election and we did it for the first time last election. And what it does is it gives people a chance to engage with us on the issues as well. So so we can get questions at the same time, we can talk to people about the issues. And I think New Zealanders want to see the range of views. That's why, for example, the um, MNP parties debates have been really popular, because people want to see what parties are offering. And so we make that available on the internet. All right. Now I'd like to turn to you and your personal story for a bit, because sure. you've been involved in politics now for what? Two decades? Yeah. Is it? Yeah. That's really not nice what I say. <laughs> you know, I have, yeah. So, yeah. so, when you first entered politics, I guess in 1993, you stood for the McGillicuddy Party. Yes. So, why did you choose to join them? I was, um, at that point, I had been a political activist for some time, working with the unemployed and beneficiaries rights movement. I'd been involved with um, an, a, um, the anarcho um and with anarchists who, who were a group of 
uh, younger, predominantly Pākehā people who had a very different view about how um, you know, our country should be run. And they had no voice. I mean, they, they were people who, these were people who too were excluded from having a voice. At the same time I was involved with uh, the Tino Rangatiratanga movement. Um, again, a significant you know, uh, Māori who again had no voice in mainstream. Um, so I, I'm very proud of a history of, of working for those people who have been locked out. And that's what I do, it's what I did as an activist, it's what I did as a lawyer, it's what I do as an MP um, in the Greens. So it's all part of that same chain, I think, of, of a history of advocacy. And so that party is now no longer around. Um, McGillicuddy's, that's right, the clan exists but the party doesn't. Yep. Yeah, but the Aotearoa Legalised Cannabis Party, you yes. also stood for them, I think yes. you were fourth on the list? Six. Six, okay, yeah. and that was in the, in the 1996, that was 96. best ever, best ever uh, result they got that year. Yeah, that was the first, the first year that, that um, ALCP set up and contested the election. Do you still have any involvement with them? Uh, not officially. I mean, I know, still know lots of the people who were involved at that time, and I still believe very strongly that we should decriminalise cannabis. I'll never uh, accept that people should go to jail simply because they smoke mm. pot. Um, and so I'm pleased that there's still a strong advocacy organisation, whether it's the ALCP, but it's also, you know, internet mana have taken up the policy now, Labour has softened its position, and I think that is wise. We're seeing some changes overseas, Colorado, um, and we need to be we need to be focused on justice and on health when it comes to drug law reform. But the Green Party don't go as far as the Aotearoa Legalised no. Cannabis Party. So you wouldn't advocate for legalisation? Our policy doesn't go that far. It go, it, we go as far as decriminalisation uh, for those who are over 18. But I do think uh, we need to have a look at the examples um, from overseas to see what legalisation has done, uh, what it, the, the benefits it's brought, what the problems might be and whether that is a better place for New Zealand to go. Uh, the, the, um, law f um, the Law Foundation has said uh, that they want to see uh, some changes in New Zealand's drug law and I think that they're very wise in their approach. So have you changed your personal stance? No. No? So you would personally be for legalisation but the Green Party is for decriminalisation? Oh I see, in terms of ALCP? Yeah. Um, I, I do think we need to be looking at what legalisation might mean. Uh, but we need to be treating drug law as if it's uh, in a rational way based on the science and there has been a huge amount of evidence that shows that decriminalising cannabis uh, reduces the harm of prohibition and in terms of medical marijuana can provide real opportunities for people, some real benefits and we need to treat that seriously. What I find in uh, drug law reform com conversations is that people think it's a joke, they laugh about it, they don't treat it seriously but for those, particularly people who are ill, it is a very serious issue and so we need to treat it seriously in policy based on science, based on rational evidence. All right. So why did you move from the Aotearoa Legalised Cannabis Party over to the, the Green Greens? Party? Uh, I, um, in 1999, it was my first year working as a lawyer, and so I had a de self-declared year of political silence, and I would do nothing in politics. It was terrible. It was 1999. It was a great election, uh, and one of my very oldest friends, Nando Tanksos, was on the Green Party list. And... Uh, he asked me to come and help with that campaign, but because I was my first year as a lawyer, um, I stuck to my year of political silence, and I watched that campaign proceed. I was incredibly impressed with the Greens. Uh, they, spoke, they spoke about the issues that I had been fighting for for such a long time, justice for unemployed beneficiaries, justice for people uh, who were marginalised and outside. They had put both Sue Bradford and Nandal Tungsos high on their list, respecting people that I had worked with in the past. Um, and I thought it would be a good opportunity to, uh, to spend some time with them and seeing what I could contribute. So I joined at the end in 2000 and uh, worked with them on their treaty policy and then was on the national executive and then eventually on their list at number eight in 2002. And you've moved up quickly since then. You're now obviously yeah. the co-leader. So yeah. how, how is it that you've moved up the ranks so quickly? Uh, I think... Um, it's just about being effective. It's about committing to the culture of the Greens. We work in a collaborative way. Uh, it's not about fighting for position. It's about working for the benefit of the whole kaupapa and for the whole organisation. Uh, and if you make that commitment in the Greens, then yes, people will see where your skills are and guide you into the places where you'll be most useful. 
Um, not everybody who is, uh, was in, is involved with the Greens like I was will be MPs. Um, they might do other parts of the, work in other parts of the organisation, but there is a place for everybody in the Green Party, and particularly for those like myself who have otherwise been locked out. All right. Now, the Green Party itself over the years has developed. Obviously, you've got stronger. As you said, the latest, I think it was the Colmar Brunton poll, puts you at 14%. Yeah, yeah we're up in today's Herald. So... There have been criticisms, though, that this has been a result of you moving closer to the centre. Yeah. Do you think that's a fair perception? No, I think it's hilarious, actually. Uh, we, have, we are not changing anything that, we've, that we say. We still advocate strongly for um, the most marginalised. We still talk very much about climate change and launched a major um, climate protection plan earlier this year. Uh, we still focused on um, child poverty, on cleaning up our rivers and our beaches. The, the same, we have the same policy and we talk about it in perhaps a clearer way now than we might have in the past, um, perhaps a more values-focused way. But the fact is the country is moving closer to the Greens. And so we are, we are the political voice for a growing movement that's focused on green issues, both economic, environmental and equitable. So uh, as the country changes, the Greens are always that political on that political leading edge, and I think that's why we're growing in support. And perhaps is that where the shift is with economics? You're costing your policies more, mm. you're saying, you know, we're going to trade off here for here. Do you think that's maybe what's coming to the foreground of your policies now, is that you, yeah. you're, you're showing yourselves as an economic choice as much as an uh, ethical choice? That's an interesting way of putting it. Uh, I think we have gotten better at talking about our economic policy. So uh, Jeanette Fitzsimons and Rod Donald uh, both were very focused on economics as the, in their co-leadership team. Uh, but because we put out the fiscals now, because we, we, we have enough money to be able to get the, it uh, independently assessed, like we did this selection with Infometrics, uh, people can have some more, they feel like they can have more confidence in our numbers. And it's just part of our growth. We've been 15 years in Parliament, um, compared to national Labour, we're still very young political party, and so it's going to take a little while for New Zealanders to get used to the values that we talk about and the way that we operate. And more and more New Zealanders are getting used to it and are giving us out their support as a result. Though in terms of climate change, we're not hearing about the crisis so much, the sea levels rising, the, the whole the world's going to come to an end thing. It's very much more, you've got your carbon tax policy, you've got cleaning up the rivers, it's very specific. Do you think that climate change is just too big of an issue? No, I think more and more people understand it now and so are looking for the very practical solutions. So the first, I guess the first half of our political presence in Parliament, we were trying to raise the issue, we put it on the political agenda so that there was more awareness. Now that there is, uh, we can talk more specifically about how the solutions we propose will make a difference. And that includes transport, energy, which we announced uh, yesterday, 100% renewables by 2030, our carbon, our climate protection plan, those are all very specific solutions to problems that the country already understands exist. Now for you personally, child poverty is a big issue. Yes. I think it's fair to say it's a big issue for a lot of New Zealanders. Yes. So where does this desire to tackle child poverty come from for you? Uh, it, it comes from having watched in the last 30 years the changes that National and Labour have put in place fail. Right. So uh, we had the massive neoliberal change in the 80s that led to thousands and thousands of people losing their jobs and becoming unemployable, my father included. Uh, and, and then the changes in the welfare system, the social security system, that left them entirely without dignity. Now that has a real cost to individuals and to families. And it's a real cost that most politicians would never understand because it's not them who are being affected. But it was me and it was my family that was affected. So I bring that with me into Parliament, and I don't want any other family to suffer like we did. Uh, it's completely unjust, and the only way to fix it is to have people in Parliament making decisions who, who, who understand that in a very real way, who were affected by it in the past. So uh, my drive for change, um, focus on child poverty, but really talking about an economy that works for everybody, not just the very rich, comes from having been affected by the failures of other politicians over the last 30 years. And so what is your plan to eliminate child poverty? Oh, we have a fantastic plan. Um, we, <laughs> we, will, we have a plan to invest a billion dollars in ending child poverty. Uh, about half of that will go towards a new children's credit. We will combine the in-work tax credit and the family tax credit together. 
uh, get rid of the discrimination that's in the in-work tax credit, and that will mean that the families of some 200,000 kids will get an extra $60 a week um, uh, from birth right up until they're 18. We'll make sure that the parental tax credit is available to the families of beneficiaries and students who are currently excluded. They are the poorest kids, they're the poorest newborns, they deserve support as well, just like other kids do. Um, and then we'll have, uh, we'll spend another about half a billion on new health and education initiatives. So uh, schools as community hubs, where there will be uh, free after school care and holiday care, dedicated nurses, um, a free school lunch fund, a community facilitator in low decile schools, uh, free doctor's visits for all children to age 18, because teenagers have very specific health needs, they too deserve access to doctors. Uh, we'll extend the 20 hours free ECE subsidy to two-year-olds so that working families who really struggle to pay very high um, uh, childcare costs will have some uh, relief in their budget, up to $95 a week. Uh, so, and all of that, that billion dollar package, is going to be paid for by a new top tax rate of 40% on those of us like myself who earn over $140,000 a year. If we are going to create a genuinely fair society, then we have to make sure we invest in our kids when they need it the most, and we need to make sure our tax system is fairer too. And at the moment, it's not fair enough. Would you reduce uh, GST then? No. Uh, there is a real issue around GST off food, and I understand why people want to do it. It seems very logical. But there's no guarantee that, the, that food prices will come down. Now, I've talked to food producers about this and they can't guarantee me that they would reduce their prices by 15% if we took the tax off. So if you're going to spend that kind of money, and we're talking you know, hundreds of millions of dollars, in order to help families do better and uh, be able to afford nutritious food, then actually taking GST off food is not the way to do it um, because there's no guarantee it'll work. We would rather lift benefits, increase wages through an increased minimum wage, uh, have government be a living wage employer, leading on that um, voluntary scheme uh, for all core public service staff and all contractors. Uh, these are the ways of um, protecting working for families from being eroded under real value and investing in public health and education services. That is the better way to improve the lot for families, I think. And I suppose one way that you're actually avoiding taking the GST off food is you're going to provide the lunches yourselves in schools, but why is that only for lower decile schools? It's for lower decile schools at this point because uh, we just want to be very careful about how much money we're spending. We know the highest need is in low decile schools, but the school lunch fund that we're offering will be available to higher decile schools on application. So it's available to low decile schools automatically, and then higher decile schools can apply for it too if they have a high need. Right. So another big policy from you is raising the minimum wage yes. to $18 an hour. Um, and that will, of course, put more money in the pockets of New Zealanders. Um, but can you really promise New Zealanders that having a wage increase of this scale will not result in job losses? Uh, yes, frankly. There is no evidence to show that if we increase the minimum wage to $18 an hour by April 2017, which is our policy, so modest increases between now and then, that there will be job loss. Uh, the, the, Simon Bridges and John Key and National have attacked um, this plan, but based on, on no evidence, it's based on theory. Um, even Moby, who produced a report about minimum wage last, last year, uh, they were modelling raising the minimum wage to $18 an hour immediately, and then had all of these catastrophic ideas about what might happen. Uh, but that's not what anybody is planning, so it just doesn't make any sense. I think it's, it's really concerning that National would campaign so hard against the lowest paid New Zealanders having a decent, a decent pay. Uh, we saw from the Nigel Ladder documentary, you know, a family there, both of whom were on low pay, one on minimum wage, one just above, and, and still not able to properly feed their kids. I mean, that, is not, that cannot be the minimum standard that we would expect of our country for New Zealand. And the fact that John Key and National Party thinks that it is an OK minimum standard is disgraceful. So we have to, we have to reset our own thinking about what stand, a minimum standard of living we would expect every New Zealander in this country to have, and particularly every child. It's not the child's fault, the circumstances that they live in. They deserve better from this country.
So do you have any concerns about this hurting businesses? Are you going to do anything to help them deal with these new operating costs? We have uh, we've looked at the degree to which SMEs, um, small and medium enterprises, employ uh, on minimum wage. It's very few, actually. Most minimum wage workers are in very large international companies, like in the aged care sector, for example, where most of those people actually do have families that they have to feed on a minimum wage. Uh, the cleaning companies, those places. And they can well afford to pay a decent wage. Uh, they just get away with it because the standard is so low. Uh, for small SMEs, we have in the past allocated some funds for a, a transitional fund to help where it was really necessary. But we are suggesting $15 an hour by Christmas and then $16 an hour next April and then dollar jumps until we get to 18. It is, it's a plan, it's a policy that business can rely on uh, and they can plan for and we don't think it will have significant effects. So while we're thinking about business and industry, Russell Norman said on the Green Room that he'd like to see the coal industry decline. Mm -hmm. Are there any other industries that you'd like to see decline in New Zealand? Uh, well, the, the coal and oil um, industry is particularly harmful to um, our environment. And it's also, it's, n also, it's not one in which there is going to be significant expansion in New Zealand. So we need to be making sure we're planning for that workforce for the next stage in New Zealand's sort of you know, economic opportunities. One of the big problems we have in this country is we don't do proper economic planning. So we're not looking at what will our economy look like in 20 years, in 30 years, in 50 years time, and then what do we need to do in our tertiary education system with our workforce, with our existing workforce to plan for that. The fact is that uh, we want to see the coal industry decline, so we must put in place now uh, the different options for those that workforce to build them up for uh, new industries. The CTU has been doing some work on just transitions. We've been trying to support that where we can um, so that there is a genuine plan for how to move towards a more sustainable economy. So where will you transition them to? If I'm a coal miner yeah. watching now, what, what are my options? Well, I mean, well, that's, that's the issue. That we need to plan for that. We need to be working with the unions and working with workers on, how, on what it's going to look like. We've, we've proposed a green investment bank, which will use uh, increased royalties from the oil and gas industry uh, to fund for development in new New Zealand business and sustainable energy industries as a way of helping facilitate that development of new industry and then we can work better with the workforce on how um, they can transition there. But that's, what the, that's the kind of planning you need and that's the kind of planning Greens will bring to a new government. So what are the industries you're looking to grow? Oh, certainly in the sustainable industries, um, but in, in terms of sustainable energy, uh, we've just announced um, a major fund for investment in gaming industry, for example, which is really fantastic. Um, because there is this huge creative opportunity here where uh, in, in games and in other... Um, and you have a personal other, interest in, in games. Yeah, I do gaming yeah. Yeah, <laughs> myself. <laughs> um, <laughs> much less now, I have to say, in this job than I used to. Um, but, the, but there's a whole lot of young people involved in new industries that are not resource intensive, that, but are people intensive and um, very creative, and give us a huge opportunity to export overseas. So those are the kinds of industries we need to be focused on. The Tin 100 is certainly is growing um, over time, and those there are a huge amount of industries in, um, in the Tin 100 that we could be supporting. The problem at the moment is National is very focused on uh, subsidising the oil industry and the agricultural industry without adding any value to those products. So it's a very, very um, poor investment, if you like. Uh, and it's not going to take us into the 21st century at all. So another big issue, this election, um, something that's being debated between John Key and David Cunliffe a lot is housing. And this time last year, I believe you said on the vote that you would want to see house prices in New Zealand fall. So what's your current oh, stance? Oh, yeah. That was a, yeah, that was a tricky one, that one. Funny, actually. Um, <laughs> the, this, was on, this was on a show um, in Auckland, and we were talking about houses and about the fact that we do need to make sure that houses are more affordable. And it's not about trying to get prices to fall so that the value people lose their value in their homes. It's about making sure that we have an affordable housing situation. And it does mean that when we have housing bubbles, people are at real risk of the value of their house falling. And we don't want that. So we have to reduce the impact of housing bubbles. And that means the state being involved in, uh, in a house building program because the state are the only ones who can build affordable homes. I've talked to uh, the industry um, about this. They've said that they simply don't, there's just insufficient profit 
and trying to build homes that you know are $350,000 or less, um, and they just can't do it. But the state can because of the low cost of borrowing and because of the size of the state, and so it should. That's what it's, that's what its job is. And so you're going to build houses? Is that Yes, so we, we're quite happy with Labour's Kiwi build. We think that that's a good plan. If they weren't doing it, we would, we would be advocating something similar. We've proposed a progressive ownership such um, programs. The rent to buy program? Yeah, right. yeah rent to buy, uh, which means you don't have to have a deposit and you don't have to have a mortgage, so there's no debt. So for very low income families who are quite fragile, it means that they are safer in their homes. Um, and if for some reason they have to stop the rent to buy part, they can stay in their homes um, and have an agreement with the state to just pay the rent like they would if they were a normal state house tenant and then go back to a rent to buy once the circumstances improve. Um, we've announced strong policy on renters because we have a million people, million adults and 400,000 kids living in rental homes. Um, it is a growing um, it is a growing issue. And so rather than try to pretend that it doesn't exist, let's make sure that renters have the same security that you do in your own home, uh, that they have the same protection for quality of housing. Um, it, renting shouldn't be a second class option in this country. And you are advocating for a warrant of fitness uh, yes. for rental houses, and yes. that's to be enacted within two years. Yep. Um, so what will the warrant of fitness ensure? Uh, not just are properly insulated in a warm heating device, which we know really works to improve the health of kids and older people, actually. But other things like a working toilet and a stove and hot and cold water and a bath or a shower, these things are not required in the law. Um, so, you know, the, if you go to ten the Tennessee Tribunal to complain about the quality of your home, um, then, then they will assess it against the rent that you pay. And that's why we've got people living in sheds and living in caravans for long periods of time, because there's no minimum standard. But there's not, again, honestly, if we got into the point where living in a tin shed is perfectly fine for New Zealanders and we should just, they should just be grateful that they're paying a cheap rent, no. They should be living in a decent house as part of core infrastructure of a civilised society that everyone has a decent warm home to live in. Uh, and so that's the standard we should be meeting, and we can. It is affordable, it's doable if government uh, reinvests in our community and our society like we should. You know, government's job is to, is to protect the weak from the strong and to share our resources wisely and fairly. You know, there's, that is our, the core role of the state, and we should be doing that, and it's not now. But are you not exposing the weak? By enforcing a warrant of fitness, have you got concerns that landlords may just pass this cost directly on to tenants? Well, the evidence we have is that landlords don't. Uh, from, so from the pilot that was done here and from um, elsewhere, where we've talked to the industry uh, and to good landlords, and I had a huge amount of feedback after we announced our renters package from landlords saying they're really pleased about the minimum standards, they're doing their best to meet them already, um, and they're pleased that we are kind of elevating the minimum standards for bad landlords who, um, you know, who, are, who are running shoddy homes. So I think that, um, that no, I think it's less likely that it will be passed on. Um, we've already put in place, part of our law change will require that if a house doesn't meet the standard um, by the due date, then the landlord can't ask for rent off that tenant, the tenant gets to stay in the home until the house comes as complies. So you've given two years them to get the houses yeah. up to scratch? Yeah, and I think and that's more than enough because at the same time, we're also going to reintroduce the full uh, home insulation program, Warm Up New Zealand. So landlords will have access to a subsidy for the insulation uh, for their home, and that's good. We want, you know, we want more and more homes to be insulated. We're quite happy for landlords to use that. Under the current scheme, under National's current scheme, they've scaled it back, and so very few landlords are taking up the insulation scheme, and they should be. Have we got the workers though? Because oh, we've got. Well, oh, yes, we do. We do. We've got Christchurch homes there still need to be completed. Mm. We've got quality control issues with some of the yep. work that's been done in Christchurch, yep. and with Kiwi Build, we're going to be building more houses. Plus, we're going to be upgrading the ones we've got, where's the labour coming from? We're not, we, we don't have quality issues when it comes to home insulation. What the Green Party scheme, Warm Up New Zealand scheme did over the last few years is build the industry that could cope with the demand. And so we have uh, networks of, uh, you know, the banks, local government, community organisations, uh, private industry, uh, 
um, families were all involved in building this new industry in home insulation. We had a lot of younger people, particularly younger men, were employed in that industry to do that work. Uh, and it was good. That's good. That's what we should be doing, building new jobs, so building new industries. Well, the yes, and the, the, the greater the demand for um, home, uh, home insulation and a Warren Fitness approach, the more that the industry will be wanting apprentices, for example. And it's not like we don't have the people in the country to do the work. You know, New Zealanders want to work, there's a lot of dignity in work, but it has to be decent work and decently paid. So let's build and dri let's drive those industries that can provide that, those kinds of jobs to the people who need it the most. And what support are you offering for that higher education and training? Oh, so uh, in terms of, for example, um, we've offered this, the student green card, uh, which will be really helpful for those who have to travel, um, students and apprentices, which is around 360,000 people, will have access to free off-peak public transport. Um, and so that's another way of helping reduce the cost. Um, one of the other major costs actually that students and apprentices face is in childcare, which is where our um, 20 hours free for two-year-olds also will make a difference. So there's support at that kind of you know, household bills um, that the Greens are putting in place. Uh, and then you know, we're going to invest more in uh, more places in the STEM subjects as well to help with new technologies. But, so you know, science, maths, yeah, science, maths, computers. Yeah. But, but at the same time, we also need to make sure that there are just, that there's lots and lots of those just ordinary jobs people can go to every day. Uh, you don't need a, a degree to do them, but you do want a decent job that's secure and well paid. Um, and the construction industry is a classic example of that. All right, so looking now at coalitions, you're yeah. happy to work with Labour on Kiwi Build, so that's a nice area of policy yeah. crossover. But what do you do in areas where you have perhaps a conflicting policy? How are the negotiations going oh, to work? Oh, well, we shall see. On September 21st, all things going well. Um, Will it be stable? Because that's the criticism coming from National. Oh, absolutely. I mean, <laughs> National just had one of their coalition partners get done for electoral fraud. I mean, really, they are in no position to be talking about stability. Uh, the, the, um, so the Greens, we've been in Parliament now for a long time. We have seen coalitions come and go. We've seen what the, what the problems are, what the risks are. Um, and we think we're in a good place to be able to enter into coalition as a strong part of that coalition government. We said we want a comprehensive coalition arrangement. So it's not just about individual projects for particular um, segments of ministerial positions. We want to have influence across the whole of the government program. Uh, and that's what we will negotiate. So where we have areas of agreement, that's great. Where we have areas of a disagreement, we will need to have a process in our coalition um, papers on how we manage that. Russell and I have been meeting with David Cunliffe uh, and his team now for some time, and before that David Shearer, and before that Phil Goff, um, to, to build strong relationships with them where we have disagreement so that once we are in a coalition arrangement together, we understand how we talk, we understand you know, the kind of ways that we communicate and we can work through it. And you did actually approach Labour and offer to co-campaign, yeah, is that correct? Why do you think they declined that? Well, we offered, we offered um, in April to, to look at how we could talk about each other um, and ourselves as an alternative government ready to lead. Um, and they declined the offer, and it was a disappointing. Um, and I, I don't really understand why. It might be worthwhile talking to them about it when you get a chance. Uh, and I think it was a mistake. I think it would have been better to, to have done that, because New Zealanders want to see an alternative government, and they want to see one that can work together and where we have a really clear system of dealing with disagreements, as you say, as well as the areas where we do agree. And that's what we had offered to work with them on. Um, but the fact is that... Um, not all that notwithstanding, we have a good relationship with Labour, we can certainly work with them in coalition. Um, I'm really looking forward to that opportunity. A, a party vote for the Greens is a vote not just for a new government, but for a new direction in that government. I don't want us to continue with the last 30 years of failed experimentation. Um, the, the, we need to be shifting to quite a different direction and only the Greens can drive that. That is the value that the Greens will add to a new government, not only on our policy and our plan, but actually shifting the country in a whole new direction towards a much more sustainable, much more just 
country. Um, that is why we're campaigning hard for the party vote, why we're campaigning um, to be a very large part of the next government, and why we're campaigning for 15%. And we're nearly there. Given though you have ruled out working with National, you are reliant on Labour, getting a strong result this election, otherwise you are going to be left outside of government once again. So are you disappointed in Labour's performance? Oh, it would be good if we were all polling well over 50% together and had been doing so for months and months. Um, but uh, we, are, we, ha we have what we have. Uh, it's, the polls right now show a very, it's, that the race will be very, very close. So uh, the real big issue now is for people to get out and vote. As I said earlier, uh, we know the right likes it when people stay home. Uh, if, if people who want a change of government want National Party members to decide their government for them, they'll stay home. But we know that actually everybody wants to go out and make the difference. I think the uh, Get Out the Vote campaigns are working really well for that because it will be a very, very fine race, this election campaign. I still am absolutely committed to changing the government and I still think it is 100% possible as long as those who want that get out and make that happen. And do you think David Cunliffe is an inspiring leader that's getting people to get out and vote? Uh, I think he's doing a fine job. Um, you know, it's we're the end of fine. The, well, not he's great. Doing, well, he's doing a fine job. I mean, I can't comment. I'm not going to comment on other. Well, another you, political you, he might end up being your prime minister. Yeah, he might, and I might end up being his deputy prime minister. Ah, so you, so, you know, okay. There's, there's, a, there's a whole. It's, um, anything is possible after September 20, as long as we change the government. That is the single most important thing to do now. National is causing people harm. They hurt people. That's what we saw with dirty politics. National will hurt people to get their way. They will spend the nation's resources benefiting their friends in order to get their way. These people are irresponsible. They are not able to govern this country uh, properly and as they must not have control after the September 20th. So the single most important thing to do right now is to change the government and to get out and vote to do it. An important uh, factor of being in government is of course being a minister, you can make a big difference. Yep. So what ministerial position would you be looking uh, towards? I've got enough, I've got the experience to do any of the social policy areas, uh, whether it's social development, education, um, housing, those would be, you know, those are my three preferred. Um, I'm also very keen on the position of Minister for Children, which I think should be a new ministerial position for a senior cabinet minister. Right. Oh, and Jacinda this, Ardern is yeah, vying for that as yep, well. Do yep, you think she'd be yep. a good one? Or oh, are you she, gonna... she'd be great too. I mean, that's the thing. We actually want Want, we want people to be wanting this position and to be doing a good job. That's a great thing. Uh, and if we can create that position and uh, have real targets for ending child poverty and for social responsibility on government agencies that require you know, cross-agency work, then you know, amazing things can happen for our families. This is, these are the new kinds of ideas that need to be part of a new, a new government with a new direction. And so it's an interesting tension with Labour because obviously you want them to do well, but do you also want also to hope to, yeah, yeah, you want to overtake them, be the, the biggest oh, party on yep, the left? Eventually. I mean, I, I, you know, there's no, we don't have a point at which we've said, well, we've grown enough, thanks, that, that'll do. Um, <laughs> so, I, you know, we want to get as big as possible. But, the, but we, we know that we will do that by working collaboratively with others who um, support our kaupapa and support our plan for change. Um, and so, at the, 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 I'm trying to say at the end of the day, you <laughs> um, can't say that anymore on New Zealand politics. Uh, the most, uh, our core purpose for being in Parliament is to is our kaupapa, you know, the environment, equality, um, and a, a, an economy that works for everybody. And so we will work with those who want the same thing. And um, whether we, we're the second largest party or the biggest party or you know, whether we stay the third pa largest party for a wee while longer, that's, that's separate to our primary intention of making real change for the good of the country after this election. And you've called for cleaning up politics. You mentioned just before the national yeah. dirty politics. Do you think the scandals are going to affect the election at all? Oh, I think they have. I think they have undermined confidence in national. Um, it, it's unheard of to have a cabinet minister uh, sacked this close to an election campaign. Um, well deserved, I have to say. It's, it was about time. You were calling for her to go a lot sooner. Yeah, yeah. Well, she <laughs> she um, has had proved herself incapable of doing her job quite some time ago. Um, so now is the time, of course, we can sack them all and, um, 
get a whole new uh, set of ministers who understand what public service is, who, un who read the cabinet manual. That would probably have been quite a helpful thing if Judith Collins had done that. Um, <laughs> the, to, who understand public service and what it means to hold the responsibility of everybody in the country in your hands, not just the mates that you drink beer with at the Sky City Bar. All right. Well, we actually, I think we have a question on Twitter. Oh, so, Sam? Yes, we've received a question via email. You can clearly work with Labour, but coalitions require other parties. Can the Greens work with Winston and New Zealand First? The answer is yes. Yes, we can. Um, the, there are some things we disagree with Winston and New Zealand First very strongly about. Um, there's no doubt about that. But uh, we have worked with them on the manufacturing inquiry, for example, last term with Labour. Um, and that was because, in large part, because the National refused to engage in the inquiry. So we set that up ourselves, the three, the three parties working together. Uh, and there are some areas of common policy as well. So I don't think there's any problem working with Winston and New Zealand First after the election. Labour have ruled out the Māori Party. Yeah. Would you do the same? No. Uh, we'll work with any party that backs our plan for a cleaner, a fairer and smarter Aotearoa. Uh, and the Māori Party are clearly, you know, they've gone with National... Um, we didn't agree with what they did there. We think that, that I'm, I'm not convinced that, that was the right thing for them to do. Uh, but that's their decision. If they are prepared to work with us, then we will happily work with them together on, on areas of common ground. And that's the same with Internet Mana? Yep, absolutely. Uh, we've worked with uh, Hone Harawera very closely over the last um, little while. His commitment to ending child poverty is, um, is very clear, and I agree with him 100% on that. So if we can work together on that, that would be great. Were you surprised with Laila Hare's decision to, to front the Internet Party? Yes, yes, I think everybody was. Um, and I'm not sure that uh, I'm not sure how many people knew about it before um, it was announced. I think it was announced on Twitter, wasn't it? Uh, but, you know, she is a free citizen. She can um, lead a party if she wants to. I'm, my biggest concern, I think, is that it started out as an attempt to increase the vote amongst young people. And I'm not sure that's where it still is. And I think that um, it has a real potential to take vote away um, and if effectively lead to National being re-elected, which is not what the co-papa of it was first. And so I think that is a real risk. No. And not Kim.com's intention. I mean, we've still got his big announcement to come. Yes, we get to see what will happen <laughs> with that. Any idea what you think that could be? No, I mean, I think, I think there's a real risk. I see that they're talking it down a little. Yeah, he's almost backtracking, yeah. saying that it's not going to have the impact that, yeah. that he first thought. So Yeah, I, and which I think is a real worry. Um, and if it's not a, the smoking gun that they have said that it is, I think that that will, that will cause some of their own people to feel quite disillusioned. Um, and I have met enough of internet money people um, to know that they're really passionate about changing the government, they're really passionate about um, new policy and a new direction. And I would hate to see them disillusioned as a result of, um, you know, a mistake at the top. Now we are coming to the end of the show and the Green Party is your very principled party. So what is it that you will not compromise on going into the next government should you be elected? Our principles. We won't. We won't. So, no, so, um, so uh, the minimum wage, $18. No, no, that's pop, that's, that's, there's, a, there's a difference. I mean, we, we are going to have to compromise on some policy. I don't know what yet because I'm not in the negotiations. But um, we're not going to get everything we want. Not yet. Not until we're like the government, um, like the biggest party. Until then, we will work with parties to get the close, as close as possible to um, our policy and to get progress. So we've said we will work with uh, Labour and with others to get progress on our plan for a cleaner, fairer and smarter Aotearoa. Um, we won't compromise on our principles, which is honouring Te Tiriti o Waitangi, uh, social justice, ecological wisdom, peace and appropriate decision making. They are the fundament of our political party, the basis on which we do everything, organise ourselves, do our policy, do our politics. Um, but we are going to have to be in a real negotiation with uh, Labour after the election and possibly other parties too. And we need to, be, we need to keep an open mind about that. So in 30 seconds then, they're approaching the polling booth. Why should they cast their vote for the Green Party? For a cleaner, a fairer and smarter Aotearoa where all our kids have what they need to thrive, where our beaches and our rivers are clean and we have an economy that works for everybody, not just the rich. Give your party vote to the Greens at this election. All right. Thank you very much, Materia. Kilda. So that does bring us to the end of today's show. 
I'd like to thank research coordinator Nissa Payne Harker for her contribution to today's show. And I'd also like to thank the University of Otago's Politics Department and Media and Communications Department for their ongoing support. Now do stick around because there is a second vote chat show today. At 3 p.m. we have Labour's deputy leader, David Parker, joining us on the show, and also the Clutha Southland Labour candidate, Liz Craig. Next week, you can see me again at 5.30. Uh, Tuesday, the 16th of September, we have Nick Smith of the National Party joining us. That will be the last Vote Chat show, so do make sure you catch it. For now, though, it is goodbye. My name's Nicole Tabor, and I thank you for watching Vote Chat. <laughs>